Welcome, I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear, Transformation Change Radio. I am delighted you joined me for part three of insights from senior diversity officers, keeping an equity inclusion focus during this pandemic and beyond. And who knew that as we're starting for some week seven, eight plus, depending on where you are in the country and the world. And I couldn't be more excited to have Dr. Ame Lambert with me. You've had so many years of experience in systemic change around equity and inclusion at several different key organizations. And I get to announce that you are the incoming Vice President for Global Diversity and Inclusion at Portland State University. I first got to know you when you were the Vice President of Equity and Inclusion and the Senior Chief Diversity Officer at Roger Williams College. I first met you through a mutual friend and got excited about the work you're doing there. But before that, you actually helped Champlain, I'm trying to see if it's university or college, Champlain College, actually start a systemic equity, inclusion, diversity work. And so I'm just so excited to have your breadth of perspectives, particularly in this pandemic. Um, and especially since you also work with newer senior diversity officers through the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Ed, Nottahe. So, couldn't be more excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining me on this radio show. Thank you, Kathy. I'm delighted to be here. And I have been a fan of your work for a really long time. So I'm so honored uh, uh, to spend time with you. And I honor all the work you've done. And I mirror the honor going back. Couldn't you just tell us a bit about yourself? And I'm particularly curious about your passion for equity inclusion work and kind of how you found that and how you found your way into what for many is very challenging, difficult work, senior diversity office work at the institutional executive level. So just help us understand who you are a bit. Absolutely. So I think um, I'm Nigerian, I'm a bicultural immigrant. So I identify very strongly as a black immigrant woman and both kind of my American culture and my Nigerian culture and the bridging between that are really important to me. So when I came, I came to the US for college. And um, for the first, I would say first four or five years, my focus really was on um, proving to folks that Africa wasn't one country, that we all were not hungry, right? That there was complexity uh, uh, um, on the African continent and did lots of things as an undergrad and graduate student to, to support that. When I was uh, uh, getting my master's at Michigan State University, I, my graduate assistantship was at the Institute for Children, Youth, and Families. And my awesome boss, I'm going to give her a shout out, Nancy Walker, um, said, you know, you're going to lead a process to write a briefing report for the state on zero tolerance policies. I did not know what zero tolerance policies were because I did not go to high school in the U.S. And she's like, yeah, do your research, we'll support you. She was really great. And through that process, I got to go to uh, schools in Detroit and Ypsilanti in Michigan um, to ask folks about their experiences. How were they experiencing zero tolerance? What were their experiences like in school? And it was absolutely transformative for me, right? Paradigm shifting, like when you say, you see, you can't unsee, that really was that experience. Because students were talking to me about metal detectors and substitute teachers and not knowing what the PSATs were. And for a person who up until that point had been spending a lot of time trying to prove that I was just like American right? I was their equal. I was middle class. I came from an educated family. To hear folks having disproportionate experiences in the U.S. was life-changing for me. Um, and I didn't know what to do about it, right? And so I ran home for a year and then came back and um, I was going to get another master's degree and happened to look at a job and saw a job as a multicultural programming advisor. And I'm like, oh, I can do that based on all the work I did in undergrad and grad school. That would be great. And that really was what started me on my uh, journey doing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. When I worked in Kansas, most of my students were either undocumented themselves or children from undocumented families. And my eyes were opened, right, in all kinds of interesting ways. And then I go to Missouri and the students tell me exactly what I heard in Michigan. Uh, substitute teachers, metal detectors. We didn't know what the PSATs were. 
and it, it clicked, right? So when I ran in Michigan, because I didn't know what to do, I, I saw a problem and I didn't know how to address it. And now I'm hearing this for students while I'm interviewing to be a director, an opportunity to be part of the solution presented to me, right? And that has been my driving force since then. I want to be part of the solution in terms of creating a world where people have the opportunity to thrive and where potential can become reality. And I am passionate about equity and justice. I am just so touched with your background and particularly as you not only name some of your marginalized identities, but you were so powerfully naming kind of some going into awareness of where you had some greater access, some greater possibly privilege. That's right. And, and you named in your bio, you do intersectionality so powerfully. And I really think particularly as we move into what are we doing today, but I don't want to get there so quick in this pandemic, how to have the full breadth of differences and all the intersecting identities. Because while that, that line that's so powerful on Facebook, we're all in the same storm, we're not in the same boats. And I actually think some folks literally don't have boats or even life preservers. And so I'm excited to learn more about systemically what you're doing. But before we do, I think it's so important to teach people in this pandemic, particularly folks with a lot of privilege, that we got to connect personally. Yeah, and I want to model that. So how are you doing in this pandemic and how are you taking care of yourself and those you are living with, if you want to share? I love that. And I appreciate that. I appreciate making space for that. Um, and it really does tie to the intersectionality piece, right? Because I am incredibly grateful to at this time be safe and healthy incredibly grateful to be able to work from home, right? Without any major disruption, it's different. Um, and going bunkers, trying to do work from home and school for my kids, right? So <laughs> it is the, the, the full range of emotions and realities um, that I think we are all trying to navigate in very different ways. I love that quote, in the same storm, but we have different boats and, and maybe no boats. I love that very much. But I, I am very aware of my privilege in this space, right? The ability to be able to step back and huddle down is a function of being educated and being middle class. And so I honor that very much. Um, and I empathize with working families everywhere who are trying to do both things and sometimes feel like they're not doing any well. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting a you know, young person in your life when we talked a few weeks ago, and that reminded me, we don't have children. Definitely. And just thinking about all the folks who are with children, as you said, folks with elder care, yes. and then I'm reminded of the folks who are essential workers slash expendable workers, yes. and at Roger Williams, and potentially now as you're moving into Portland State, there are so many employees who are still working, still showing up on campus. There are still some students on many campuses. I'm not sure about the two you're currently connected to. But as you just kind of keep going, how has the pandemic impacted at this campus level? Right. The leaders, the students, the staff, the faculty across all hierarchy and intersecting identities. Just how are people doing in the seventh, eighth week of this. Yeah. So I, I will start with the things I am in awe of. And the thing I am in awe of is the way folks have come together to support student success, right? Um, when you think about, and there are all kinds of conversations about remote learning and intentional versus, you know, kind of thrown into it. And I, I honor the realities of that. But when you think about all the players that it is taking across you know, institutions across the country and speaking specifically at Roger Williams to translate all of our courses online and to, you know, sustain remote learning. So I just, I need to start with a shout out, right? And just kind of some awe around that. Um, I love, again, that different boats, right? So the different boats become clear all the time, right? Students who uh, now have responsibility for taking care of folks at home, right? Because their family members are essential workers and have to go out, right? And so school is closed and there's ripple effect. We've navigated pieces around access, right? Access to technology, access to good technology. It might be there, but does it support streaming video, right? So all of those pieces have been front and center for us. In our state, so we're in Rhode Island, 45% um, of folks who have tested positive are Latinx. Right. And so when you think about these disparities throughout the country, it's in our backyard. It's real for us. 
Um, what it what it's doing, what the pandemic is doing is amplifying disparities or making them visible in ways that folks who were not engaged in the conversation did not know. What I'm realizing is your last line is so, well, first of all, 45% Latinx. I see in the media here in Colorado, some Native American, some mostly African American is what's in the media which is also true so many places, but you're reminding folks to go regionally and locally and find out what's the experience in your area. And it's while you're holding the national impact, but the racial uh, disparities because of healthcare and racism and systemic yeah. dynamics, we could, we could talk for hours. That's right, that's right. You, you landed on people as I do, every time I talk to someone, I have to be reminded of all my privileges and, oh, it's another gap. I do these things called community connections twice a week, Tuesdays, Fridays. Folks are coming and we're doing our 13th tomorrow. Just a safe, confidential space. How are you doing? And every time I leave with more understanding and awareness. And my question to you is I'm talking to people all over the country. Many people, senior diversity officers and throughout the organizations are saying, my direct supervisor, including all the way up to the president and the execs there don't have the awareness of the full impact across the full breadth of differences that this pandemic is having on people and the cracks that are in our policies, programs and services. Yeah. So I just be curious how you see leaders and maybe things you're doing to help senior leaders sustain their energy because they've got competing challenges fear of economic survival. So I have impassioned empathy and how are you supporting and keeping equity inclusion on the screen? Yeah, so that's a, a powerfully important question. I, I think that having feedback mechanisms is so important, right? And so we all don't know what we don't know, right? So I, I benefit from having the our queer and trans resource and advocacy center, international students uh, services and programs and multicultural student services and programs, you know, in our division and with excellent assistant directors who are on the ground in a way that I'm not, right? So we have the, the people are feeding up, hmm, time zones are a challenge. Huh, there are students who are not out to their families. Now they're home and they're in places that are unsafe. So what happens? Do they now have to be dead named for the rest of the semester, right? Because they're in a place that they were not planning to be, right? Students who are the access pieces. So it really is important to have feedback mechanisms and then to make sure that there is open communication. I think this is a time for folks to be having lots of campus-wide meetings. So we've been doing lots of town halls. If folks are not doing town halls, I would encourage that because there's just an opportunity to hear what is going on with folks. So now I'm in regular Zoom, everybody's in Zoom meetings. I'm in Zoom meetings with, with faculty, but just hearing their perspectives, right? And each faculty is having a radically different experience depending on the class, depending on the students, but to hear what they are grieving, right? As folks who wanna deliver excellent education and to hear what they're hearing from their students has been so important. So communication and feedback mechanisms, I think are incredibly uh, important. I think affinity groups also are a way to amplify, right, the needs of populations that we might not be thinking about all the time. We've been trying to do like all of our programs, all of our support programs, we've moved them virtually, right? And whether two people show up or 20 people show up, just having like you're doing with the community connections, it's so important to have these safe spaces, these touch points for people to just come and know that they can vomit without any sort of judgment. But there are also things that might float up to the top for us, right? So if a student, a student just this just happened, you know, their parents have lost their jobs. And we can reach out and say, can we help you navigate the unemployment process? That's not why they came. They came to find community, but it signals to us, can we give you access to the emergency fund? What are ways that we can respond, right, to the needs that we're hearing from our students? So absolutely communication and feedback uh, is what everybody should be doing. Again, great new ideas from me that, that'll involve, tell me where I'm wrong, getting faculty know these are options and staff and faculty with the resources or at least who to refer to yeah. so that we can support folks in some of that. Um, how do you apply for unemployment if they have a small business, maybe even PPP. That's right. um, and you mentioned grief as some campuses are planning the next week or two, virtual graduations, some have put them off to August. 
hoping that maybe they'll be in person. Yep. Um, the grieving of not having in-person teaching, in-person student service work, just mm -hmm. the colleagues. I worry, and I'm sure you do too, that there is so much grief and fear. Are there ways you all are creating space for that? You mm -hmm. mentioned affinity groups. Or what ideas do you have that campuses, I mean, we were running around kind of major crisis. Yeah. Have we opened up in a bandwidth, or am I still too far ahead of the curve for grieving and then what possibilities could be put in place moving forward? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so as the bandwidth piece is, is, is legit because institutions all over the country, including ours, are working on scenarios, right? And so what we're really trying to do is not be binary, not are we going to open or are we not going to open, right? But recognizing that there are so many factors outside our control, right? Trying to, to prepare for a full slate of, of, of options. So while there's lots of attention focus there, this is where, so going back to the affinity groups, right? So we have affinity groups and then I wanna give a shout out to our leadership academy, right? And so these are folks who are emerging leaders and proven leaders on campus who in some ways, because they're next level down, can kind of take on the mantle of leadership around kind of care for the community while executive leaders are working on the scenarios with input from the campus, right? And so I think that these kinds of spaces, student senate, our student senate is back on and having conversations become really important. We sent out, because you know, you know, with emotions, especially negative emotions, naming it is the beginning of it. And like you did at the beginning, making space, right, for that, for emotions and for check-ins and self-care is really important. But we sent out a letter to the campus and it just said everything that you said, right? That here, we started locally, here's what it looks like for us in our region, but we spoke to indigenous communities and African-Americans nationally. We spoke to the structural pieces about right around this. And we're like, this is not abstract data, right? These are our folks in our community. So students to your classes, students who will have been in your programs, so this is the reality. And I think like continuing to name that because when I'm stuck trying to just do my own stuff, make sure my kid is not on me while I'm having a meeting, trying to make it through class, I am going to forget, right? And somebody's gonna tell me I can't submit an assignment and I'm going to think, they're lazy, right? I'm gonna think I need to do the same thing for everybody, equality versus equity. And so the naming just the, re, the, the reminders of it are really critical. We don't wanna fo put folks who are struggling up and we don't wanna tokenize them or, or exoticize them, but making this real uh, is so important, right? So like, this is not, don't worry about just, uh, Give money, give money. But I think there's a tendency to give money to people out there because people out there are struggling and not think about what's happening in our own community. So naming it and making space is not critical. And to your point, even though there might only be two, three weeks of this spring semester left, can staff and faculty again be writing students at you know their spheres of saying, how are you doing? Okay. How can we support you in these last couple of weeks? Because when I look at Facebook and the news and seeing more people, mostly that look like me, my race, out on beaches and out in parks, um, I worry that some folks might think, well, I'm doing okay, so the students need to be, and we can forget, as you said, especially as more unemployment is happening every week. Whew. Right, right. So as I loved how you so powerfully said the second and third levels of leadership can be using the equity inclusion lens because they're closer to students, yeah. they're closer to staff, they're asking questions about what are we doing differently in remote that is working maybe better than before? What are the gaps that we're finding? Your senior leaders are so busy probably with financial concerns and scenarios. So that does raise as a concern for me, how can senior diversity officers and maybe their allies on those executive teams keep the intersections on the screen when my concern and fear is that executives are triggered into fear and they're just running as opposed to slowing down to say, if we do X, who does that impact? Who does it serve? If we do Y, who does it impact? Who's negatively hurt? Yeah, and, and, and so there are a couple of things, right? So I think for senior leaders, mission and values don't disappear because there's a crisis, right? And so um, it will be at every meeting, 
here are the realities, here are the things we're looking at, and then what does this mean for equity, right? Like having a piece of that you know, as part of any scenario, like whatever scenario you come up with, you have to figure out how the different pieces are gonna to pivot to support that. What does it mean for equity? So there needs to be an equity piece to every scenario so that there, there's opportunities to think about this. But again, let me go back to the feedback pieces you know, with a very specific example, right? So we're no different from uh, um, many other institutions being touched by salary reductions and furloughs. And what started, what came up uh, was, um, and there, there's a point that I will come back to, was folks were like, well, we know that everyone doesn't earn the same thing. Everyone doesn't have the same realities. So we want a tiered salary reduction model, right? And this came up from faculty in our law school, regular faculty in our undergrad institution. The leadership listened. So that's the other piece, right? So you have feedback mechanisms, but you have to listen to that because there is a cost. Equity is not cost-free. That's why people don't do it, right? It's easier not to do it and it's cheaper not to do it, right? That's why folks tend not to do it. And then, you know, preserving the status quo is great for some. Um, so the fact that people spoke up and said, look, we are going to keep our mission and values. We recognize the reality, but we recognize that the impact is not the same. And so we will step up and propose this. And then the leadership responded and it took more work and it was more complex to do it that way, but that's what we did. So I, I, I encourage folks who are uh, champions, which is another thing, everything you do before a crisis impacts what happens during the crisis. We already have a community that is committed to equity and inclusion, right? And so that's the community that we're looking to, to continue to remind us of our values, to continue to put stuff on the table. This was the ground up thing uh, that there was space for people up about and that the leadership responded to. I think that becomes really critical because as you said, best of intentions, but we're running a mile a minute. I'm the equity officer, I'm getting triggered, right? And so like in some ways, sitting there looking at stuff, I need somebody to remind me of what my core values are, remind me of what my responsibility is, and then I'm activated again, right? And I can speak with my colleagues and they're also getting activated by their, their team members. I love it. And if the top leadership isn't leading, equity officer can, and sometimes there are some backlash. If you were the only one who would come back from break, I want to talk about what's some of the resistance. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Lambert, would you mind just letting folks know who, you know, folks that may want to contact you, if you're willing, how they can find you either to come talk to them on their campuses, do some virtual trainings, they want to reach out as a mentor, how can they find you? Yes, uh, I think LinkedIn will be the easiest way uh, since I'm moving from one job to the other. So just R. Lambert, um, anybody else is an imposter, but R. Lambert on LinkedIn will be the quickest way to reach me. Thank you so much. And again, I'm excited you joined me. I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear. Do you want to find some of my resources? on the radio show link, or you can always just go to my website, drkathyorbear.com backslash events. You'll see all kinds of things. Re community connections, free, come together. Let's just talk about how we're doing. My Navigating Difficult Situations course, I've made free for the pandemic and the transition through August, most likely. It's like six hours of videos of difficult situation tools and skills and 100 page program book. My course on designing facilitating workshops is a wonderful community of folks. I think using this time in the pandemic as you get a little more bandwidth to really invest in your own development, that might be interesting. And finally, the free access to In It for the Long Haul, self-care. I'm looking, um, the webinar and book is there as well as worksheets. Seventh, eighth week, folks are gonna need more self-care and community care. So I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear with Dr. Ame Lambert. Come on back after the break. We'll talk more about how do you keep equity inclusion focus during this pandemic and beyond. We'll see you in a few minutes.
Welcome back. I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear, Center for Transformation and Change, and so excited, Dr. Ame Lambert from Roger Williams and now Portland State University. Thank you for joining me as we continue to talk about what are some of the challenges as well as opportunities in this pandemic to keep equity inclusion on the screen, advice from senior diversity officers. So, Ame, this was your question over the break. Thank you so much as we're winding down, some folks on campuses might be like, oh, maybe we get a break. And yet, so many of our students that we're serving, some are still on campuses and so many are still in need as we move into the summer. What are some of the strategies you know campuses are doing to be that bridge to help folks that maybe some will say, well, you know, we're going back to work now. We've opened up the states. So what do you know? Absolutely. Uh, remember that the need continues. Uh, remember that folks are dealing with housing insecurity. That's not going anywhere. Um, remember food insecurity. Lots of institutions across the country have kept their food pantries open. I honor that. Um, I've heard folks uh, putting students in hotels uh, if they needed to be off campus. I've heard of folks keeping people on campus. We've kept some folks on campus for a variety of reasons, if home was unsafe, if they couldn't get to their home countries. Um, so I just, I really do wanna honor that globally and encourage folks to keep thinking about that. Um, students, you know, for a lot of students, college is more than about getting an education, it becomes an anchor. And so that anchor doesn't go away in the summer um, because they're not in class. So I just encourage people to remember that and keep connecting folks with resources. The metaphor of the school that can be the anchor when everything else in the storm. Um, your idea earlier about offering to students support around, can we help you think about applying for um, unemployment or helping your family members? Being that it was just the first of the month and April, so many in this country had trouble didn't have money for rent or mortgage in April, much less May. Okay. And pandemic checks, $1,200 don't stretch and many still have not received them. Just wonder how many campuses are offering to support extended family. Because when yeah. you see housing insecurity, there might be more people living in a space than were for years. And that space may be not being able to be there in the future. That's right. So all of these supports, and then, you know, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, we've, you know, we've got to take care of, of, of shelter, of food, but like you opened up, Kathy, I think the emotional pieces, um, so these hangouts, so like, you know, all of these virtual things we're doing, technically they end at the end of the, of the school year, right? But continuing that through the summer, so if a person, just needs a space where I can be fully myself for all kinds of reasons that they have that space. And again, going back to the anchor piece, it continues to be a place once a week. I know that on Thursdays at three o'clock, I'm going, right? And everybody knows who I am. Everybody's affirming me. And then I go back and I come back and I breathe and I go back. And so recognizing that all of those pieces have to continue, even though usually there wouldn't be like this kind of uh, programming in the summer is really important. And so for students and staff and faculty, new ideas you're sharing. What if we encourage people to plan through at least early August until right. it's not needed? That's right. Weekly, if not bi-weekly, time to come, just as you said, how are you doing? What are your needs now? What does your family need? And just a support. Because I do fear that fatigue is setting in. It is. Oh, fatigue. Mm -hmm. And if leaders at several layers are spinning in, are we even going to be financially solvent? What do we do if we can't open? Okay. Then the distance from what's really going on in students' lives, I have fears about that. So that is one way they might be able to stay. They may not have to organize it, but they can attend. That's right. And with the fatigue, I do fear that, that there has been resistance in that senior diversity officer saying, who will this impact by different identity groups and may have been brushed to the side before, but particularly now there and people saying things like, you know, we have hiring freezes. We have to hire the best candidate. 
we can't be doing all this outreach. And so the, especially the racist implicit bias, the racist attitudes of what the best looks like in, we don't have enough time to search that much. We have to get somebody now. So my fear is with either hiring or who we're laying off, there's going to be and has been privileging folks and privileged identities more and particularly folks of color are um, once again, well, it's really experiencing okay. racism. Well, I think one of the things that I love about your work and that I'm a fan of myself is kind of the neuroscience pieces, right? So there is, when, when people are afraid and their threat response is activated, our worst, worst, most primitive impulses take over, right? And, and, and so the piece is about stopping and mindfulness, right? And just looking for ways to connect to our higher being, our higher selves, our best selves becomes really important, right? But as you know, when people are triggered, finding ways to get to the heart of it, what are people afraid of, right? You named the grieving process we talked about earlier. What is, right? And so if everything feels uncertain, what I will hold on to is my certainty of my privilege, right? And so uh, Martin Luther King said that so, so eloquently, right? Like, oh, well, I'm really hungry. I can't feed anybody, but I'm white. And so, dang it, I have something I can hold on to that keeps me. And so that's what prejudice is going to do. Everything is very, is, is, is kind of crazy. This feels true that I am better than you, right? Whatever that looks like, whatever that feels like. So what research is starting to tell us around neuroscience is that if you think about you know, prejudice in some ways, especially implicit prejudice as a threat response, then things that we can do to deactivate our threat response help out, right? And so positive emotions, kind of suppress prejudice, it might be temporary, but it works. Um, relaxing, not being as stressed, right? And so the things that we do for holistic health become even more important when we're talking about prejudice reduction in a stressful situation, right? And so, and then primers also become very important. How are you exposing folks to positive images of minoritized people, right? And so, um, I was going to come up with come up with all kinds of interesting ways to do that, but I think you know again having affinity groups and providing spaces for the affinity groups uh, um, to be their wonderful, bright, uh, uh, critical thinking selves reminds us that even though people are not at the table, they are valuable contributors. Bringing student voices in, we're talking about you know what's happening with commencement, who's doing virtual, who's delaying, or whatever. So lots of touch points with students. Yesterday, today is Monday. The days run over. Yesterday. Uh, we had a virtual student award ceremony for graduating seniors. It was amazing, right? It was amazing to be reminded that our students, wonder how much we miss our students because it's great to, to kind of see their pictures, but reminded of the great work that our students are doing, right? And I hope for them, it was a touch point and a reminder that we value them and that they have a lot to offer a world that feels very uncertain right now. So versions of kind of rituals and traditions Whatever way we can bring that back, we need to figure out ways to bring that back. So we we are hopeful that in August we will be able to have an in-person commencement. But these other pieces, these other touch points, uh, have been so important as the students because it's a, it's a rite of passage. We want to honor that, right? That this is the journey, and they've been looking forward to it. We need to be able to honor, do some things in May, and so this was a great way to do it. Oh, and those great rituals also help with the grief and transition. That's right. And new idea that you might be doing it, I could imagine that, especially in some of the affinity groups, three or four folks at the time, or one at saying, here's how what my family is experiencing, here's what's been really helpful from the college, and here are some things that I think would be useful. And that could happen, some faculty could organize those voices, but again, it's a different way to get feedbacks, loops, as you've been talking about, up, but that visual, may actually open the hearts of and slow down folks that are spinning and triggered to go, this is why we're doing it. And you know what? That idea we're considering actually has a negative impact across people that are undocumented and maybe some of the folks that are refugee mm -hmm. and actually folk of color in general, ooh, parents with kids. So, ooh, people That's with right. disabilities. And just thinking it, slowing them down. That's right. I love it comment about uh, new, is it neuro, N-E-U-R science? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I got to look up more. Um, the idea of positive imagery of folks who have been um, aligned with prejudice and bias to keep a few of us up here thinking we're smarter, better, we're superior. Mm -hmm. I just, um, someone sent me Dr. Heather McGee's TED Talk. And then I also realized this week, Chris Hayes on his podcast interviewed Dr. Heather McGee. So I was gardening, listening to Dr. Heather McGee. I hope I said it enough times. So folks, go find Dr. Go Heather, find Heather McGee. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I know there are thousands upon thousands of folks that are just in their brilliance about dismantling racism, dismantling classism, and then the intersection with Dr. Heather McGee talks about. So I just wanted to remind folks to use this time. Free professional development could be sending out a podcast and saying, would love the people in our area to look at this. And then let's come together now and just talk about what you're learning and how does this impact? And then ask people to offer because they may have all kinds of dynamics of awareness that they would like their teams or their whole division to learn podcasts today or free virtual trainings or yeah. webinar Wednesday about creating inclusion partner programs. So all kinds of free resources now virtually. And I, I just want to honor that, that the investment you are making in all of us by making these materials free. Uh, I mean, it's amazing because you know, it's week six, week seven, people are still finding their routine, but in the new normal or the next normal, which is the only thing I can guarantee, right? That it's not. These like lean into ways to expand our capacity to be resilient, to respond. That's exactly what we need to be doing that, during this time. So thank you. Thank you for, for making these resources available. Mm -hmm. And there's so many others. Um, and so what do you recommend people say when they have a senior leader or two, particularly if they're the person with the purse strings, whether it's president, financial officer, or just a power person who right. says, yes, equity inclusion, when we get our feet back under us, but right now we need to focus here. What do you recommend and how do you recommend the benefits of having an equity focus now? Yeah. Because it's not just costs a lot of money, hard to do. It actually has our future. That's right. So I would recommend saying that there are all kinds of survival, right? And so when we say that this work is about our survival, it is. Um, and so again, going back to being in a trigger space, being in a fear space, you, you know, your focus kind of narrows, all you can see is right in front of you. But I remind folks that before the pandemic, higher education was already facing incredible headwinds, right? Uh, demographic shifts, willingness to pay, value higher education, automation. Like it wasn't like it was smooth sailing and then boom, you know, this happened, right? And so all the pandemic is doing is accelerating stuff that needed to be dealt with anyways, right? Uh, and then I would say adding another layer because now physical safety in some ways uh, uh, um, has been front and center. So when we talk about long-term survival, sustainability, viability, I can hear an institution say, hey, if we don't do these things, we won't be here to talk about long-term viability, right? But this really is about our survival. If we don't figure out how to pivot, how to shift, how to... Um, graduate more students from different backgrounds, how to advance them, right? How to make room for different perspectives at a time when innovation is needed in ways that has not been needed before. This will be about, a, we will not be here. So I get it, I do, I really do get it. I'm at the table, I, I recognize the realities, but this is a, it's an opportunity. Look, we, you know, as you said, bandwidth, you know, everybody head down, figure out how to survive. And we have to start finding pathways to thriving. Um, or else survival will be for all of us, we'll just will be done. So I, when I think about, I've been thinking way before the pandemic, I've been thinking about demographic shifts and the fact that we live in a reality that had not figured out how to advance minoritized folks. And so it was a good thing to do. It was really important. And then corporate has been saying more and more, no, this is a business imperative. Look at the money. 
and yes, but not really because the numbers at the top have not been moving. And then I'm like, but at some point with everything we're seeing, there will be nobody, right? Like, so it's like, oh, it would be really nice to have more like folks of color, more women, or more queer folks, or more immigrants. But really, like, we're fine. Like, cause we can find this person. And I was like, I, that's not that's not going to be true, right? And so, whether you're talking about university leadership or corporate leadership, if you look at all of all, all of the trends in terms of retirements and stuff, and so something we have not been able to do when things were relatively fine we now have to figure out how to do at an accelerated pace. And so I just, I really think that there's an opportunity for corporate, for public and for higher ed to figure this piece out, right? So that we're not doing, it's like P20. I gotta figure out how to start at the top and go all the way through. What are the conversations that people need to start having early? Keep talking about these things and it's so complex and layered, but I keep talking about, look, I need to know my job, right? So there's this technical piece. I need to know how to do my job. And if you're minoritized in any way, you better really, really know how to do your job because you're gonna face extra, extra scrutiny, right? So you need to be technically excellent. And then there's the social emotional piece, right? If you're underrepresented, if you're minoritized, you are going to have more reasons to be triggered. Let's do Kathy's course, it's so important, right? So there's a social emotional capacity that you need to have navigating as an underrepresented or minoritized person. And then there's the navigational piece. You are, you're in a foreign world. There are rules that are unwritten that you don't know, right? We talk about that with college students. It's very true in organizations as well, right? And so you need dominant mentors or you need non-dominant people who have been there to like interpret things for you. And somehow the other, and then this is kind of, this is just with minoritized communities and then institutions, the work that you do in terms of dismantling isms, if we don't figure out how to accelerate all of this at the same time, <laughs> uh, we're talking about leading, needing leadership skills in a world that's going to be radically different because jobs are going to be automated. People need to be agile. They need a growth mindset. Oh, okay. <laughs> we better get to work. <laughs> I need to breathe. <laughs> well, you're so powerfully naming the challenge of what an opportunity to shift from just a nice thing to do demographics yeah. to hiring people who are culturally competent, which is critical okay. to know this is really about culture change okay. and to really seeing, in my opinion, that most leaders of color throughout the organization have skills and competencies and a ways of engaging that can help our traditional dominant culture shift. So it's not top-down leadership. It's not just a few deciding, but to really have many voices and valuing and amplifying creative innovation. And that's gonna take showing leaders examples. So tell me what you like about this idea, if at all. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine if senior diversity officers said to everybody in their division and everyone in their whole university and college, Give me examples of how you are being innovated in this critical crisis time that you never believed you could, but you're finding we're doing this. Or we realized if we do it a little differently, we serve even more folks. That's right. And then showing that to the leader so they maybe see how actually empowering and amplifying more voices might get the culture change that they say they want strategic plan. That's right. That would be amazing. I think, you know, because, uh, you know, I, 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 the disability idea of universal design, right, is such a powerful metaphor, right, that if you do this to create access, it actually works, right, for everybody. And, right? and so, yes, I think that, I do think that there's a room for uh, um, kind of a national diversity leader conversation about this, right? In terms of what you're doing is just so great. How do you keep the equity agenda at the table? But I think we have to figure out how it connects, right? And so that's our responsibility at our institutions, but we need to figure out how to elevate it. Uh, yes, yes. Convene us. Mm. Well, as we wind down, we have six or seven minutes. Have there been some ways at the different universities or colleges or ideas that really helped leaders deepen their capacity to have equity inclusion on their lens all the time? And I think that means they have to realize privilege, marginalization, full breadth of differences. So are there some ways historically you or others have really helped leaders to not go into white fragility and leader fragility, but come to the table and really humbly show up as learners? 
Yeah. So they're they're yeah yeah. Um, I will say three things. Uh, one is that the equality versus equity question is such a foundational one for this work, right? Because, and I'm speaking as a non-American, um, equality is such a strong American value, right? And so you take individualism and equality and you put it together and it's like, uh, um. so if people do not understand that folks are not trying to be lazy, uh, folks are not less motivated, they're actually things that are preventing their greatness from materializing it, they, 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 from materializing, then they can't engage. So spending a lot of time on that is, is, is really important in this work. Um, and then I would say that, again, as speaking as an immigrant, just understanding the construct of whiteness and how European ethnics became white, I have found to be such, so for me as an immigrant to be talking to European ethnics about the process of them becoming white and how the system became porous for them, uh, but not for others. But a lot of folks don't understand the process, right? They just, folks will say I'm ethnically Italian, or I'm ethnically, po no, but people mostly don't understand the piece. And so they need to understand, hey, everybody came, everybody was discriminated. Some did not come by choice and here's what happened, right? And so that piece I, I find in my work to be really important to be able to have a conversation about kind of the marginalization of people of color. Because I think fundamentally people are like, where am I in the story? What about me, right? And so if you don't make that bridge from this is me and I did have challenging, my people did struggle here and they might still be struggling, but here's what happened, right? Here's what happened post-World War II. I think that becomes really, Critical. And then I think the last piece, and this goes back to some of the newer science pieces and the cost of equity work, is you know this about, you're speaking about white fragility, that there are people who cannot hear us. They just can't, right? For whatever, they shut down, they get afraid, they're afraid they're guilty, whatever. And so you need bridges. You need white folks' as bridges, right? Speaking to community. And Kathy, I honor that. That's what you do so much. And then there are people of color who also need to be bridges, right? You understand fragility. Um, and in spite of your triggers, <laughs> you figure out how to navigate through, right? And so <laughs> we need dominant and non-dominant bridges from different communities uh, to be able to help the work move forward. And I think that equity officers, allies, um, whether we know it or not, that's one of the things that we have to do uh, in terms of that bridging work. So because it's not cost-free, it needs to be recognized and it needs to be honored. The, the, I think the last thing I will say is, if you think about some of these pieces, the way the world has changed very quickly, there are some pieces that are not going anywhere, right? The way remote work has accelerated is not going back, right? Hopefully going back to physical school is going back because I can't sustain this. So that, that, that I hope is coming back. But okay. uh, that's right. But think about professional development budgets and people who have not been able to engage, that are not able to engage virtually, right? And so. So there are so many things that are different, um, you know, as much as I joke about, you know, not being able to do work in school, people are spending more time with their families. People are getting reconnected to what matters, right? If you're out of an alpha space, you're better able to like, just kind of connect with your deepest, deepest values. And so I think all of these things, even though they might not seem directly equally related, they all are. And so how we, hold on to the pieces from this that we should keep is something that equity officers should be thinking about. And, and it's part of, that's part of our self-care, right? Because future thinking and hope also helps us be more resilient in the present. So I hope that my colleagues and I will continue to keep equity uh, um, at the center and continue to think about it in these really complex ways because these are complex times. So many great points, the both and. What's tough, what do you still need and? What are we learning? What's been positive? How are you personally gaining? Anything you're noticing? Where do you have hope and concern? That itself challenges the dominant white supremacist culture. Okay. Wow. And the reason I actually got on my screen is you did leadership at the senior level and then the AVP level reading groups. And the take, why well, I have so many takeaways, but one for me as a white change agent is to spend time with whites Tell me the story, what you know of the family over generations and the different ways mm -hmm. you experience, different parts of your family experience different forms of oppression. 
kind of have room for intersectionality? And when did different parts of your family start to get different parts of privilege? Mm -hmm. We white so fear being called racist and thinking we're the problem and that it's personally attacking as opposed to systems. Thank you for that brilliant strategy. And that could be people, people could do now with leadership, mm -hmm. reading groups at different levels. So it has some group development and mm -hmm. some and anonymity and confidentiality. Okay. So we got to wrap this puppy. Do you have a final thought, Hope? And please again, tell us how people can find you. Yeah. So my final thought is that this work is critical. This work is central. I've heard from some of my colleagues that they have felt marginalized during the process. They haven't been at the table. Don't worry, keep inserting yourself keep doing your thinking and strategizing because an opportunity is gonna come up where you know all of that work, free work that you've done will be important. Your work is so important. And again, Kathy, I honor your work. I honor your leadership. And I just say, be well, be safe. Um, let's, let's do the both and let's take care of ourselves now, but let's be thinking about the future. Dr. Ame Lambert on LinkedIn, I honor you so much. Thank you. I'm taking away so much. And I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear, and you can find me every first Monday at the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific, whatever time, 1 p.m. Eastern. And I've got a fourth part. So May 21st, going to have two more senior diversity officers, Kim Baker Flowers, who's at CSU East Bay, formerly Portland Community College, and uh, Dr. Beth Dow Douther Cohen, currently Executive Director, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Frederick Community College, formerly Associate Leader in Equity Inclusion, Maryland College Park. So they've been in community colleges and significant four year. I can't wait to have part four. Ame, I'm so grateful for you, so grateful for all the key leaders that are doing so much equity inclusion on our screens as we're in this pandemic, supporting the thriving of our students, staff and faculty. I wish you the best and I wish you all the best. I look forward to seeing you on the radio show next time. Take care. <laughs>